Over the last 20 years, there's been an exponential increase in human-wildlife conflicts, and this is because human populations are expanding, and as they expand, they're encroaching on wildlife habitat. Despite urbanization, there's a lot of urban sprawl, and people wanting to live closer to nature cause a problem indirectly by being in the middle of that and disturbing habitat. The primary role of wildlife fertility control is to manage conflicts between people and deer and other wildlife. I think managers are, for the most part, in a very difficult place. They're mandated to maintain those populations at particular levels, to preserve habitat, and to make uh, room for other species, and in some cases, multi-use uh, landscapes. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the vocal public is saying we don't want management as it has been traditionally, which was for the most part hunting or perhaps other lethal methods, and those are becoming less acceptable in today's climate. Urban and suburban areas are using fertility control to manage pigeons, commensal rodents, deer, and even primates. In addition, populations of iconic species such as African elephants, kangaroos, and koala bears are being managed with fertility control. There are several fertility control methods used to manage wildlife populations. One is surgical sterilization, where veterinarians perform surgical procedures like ovariectomies and vasectomies to prevent reproduction. Wildlife managers also use fertility control agents that are administered via hand injection or through a remotely delivered dart. There are also oral contraceptive baits that are distributed using delivery methods designed to prevent consumption by non-target wildlife. I believe wildlife uh, fertility control has a very, very big role to play as a complementary tool or as a alternative tool to traditional methods to manage wildlife. It's very important as far as containing wildlife uh, populations are concerned in that uh, it is really the only method that slows down population growth. Fertility control has a very limited application to these protected areas and areas where no type of hunting is feasible, the public will not tolerate it, and there needs to be some alternatives. Assateague Island National Seashore was the first place in the United States where PZP, porcine zona pellucida, was tested for efficacy on a herd of wild horses. The Assateague ponies live on a barrier island off the coast of Maryland and Virginia, and they have no natural predators, so the only way to really manage their population growth rates is to limit reproduction in some way. What happened initially when we began darting uh, in 94 is that the population immediately stabilized, and that was for nearly 10 years, and it was around 2002, 3, 4, that it began to really drop off. Three or four years before we hit 100, we began to back off on treatment. And what we did was instead of treating three consecutive years, we would treat two or one. One of the things that our chief of interpretation at the time felt was really important was to keep information out there. And let the public know what we're doing, why we're doing it, the science behind it. And so we've actually had the support of the public uh, pretty much throughout this project. Following the success of managing wild horse herds on Assateague Island, wild horse managers with the Bureau of Land Management began using the contraceptive PZP to see if they could manage wild herds in open systems in western landscapes, and Pryor Mountains was one of the first places they began testing it. I was adamantly opposed to fertility control because in the early 2000s, we saw the mountain lion predation really stepping up. And I felt that this was a herd that had a real chance to be naturally managed. In other words, humans didn't have to step in. And unfortunately, hunters killed the mother mountain lion with her kittens and the full crop started to go up. So we don't kill things but we prevent them from being born.
The Science and Conservation Center in Billings, Montana is a nonprofit organization and they're devoted exclusively to manufacturing, distributing, and training people to use the immunocontraception vaccine PZP. The protocol that we use right now is to do a primer dose and no sooner than two weeks to let the immune system work to give them a booster. And we can get 95% efficacy. The National Academy of Science put out a report in 2013 and it states that PZP, immunocontraception, should be used to control the population of wild horses, that this is a tool that does work and should be used. The 2013 National Academy of Sciences report also indicated that the fertility control agents Gonacon and PZP-22 are promising tools for managing wild horses and burrows. Gonacon is federally registered for wild horses, burros, and white-tailed deer, and researchers are currently working to determine if it can be used to help manage prairie dog populations at parks and public areas in the western United States. Prairie dogs are a keystone species of grassland ecosystems. Animals such as hawks, owls, foxes, endangered ferrets, and many others depend on prairie dogs for food or their burros for shelter. Urban and suburban communities can play an important role in prairie dog conservation by promoting the use of humane, non-lethal management strategies for mitigating conflicts with prairie dogs, including, but not limited to, barrier installation, relocation, as well as the use of fertility control to manage population growth. So my name is Dan Sorkeld. I'm a research scientist at Colorado State University. Um, and I'm a uh, wildlife ecologist. We are in a prairie dog colony um, in Four Collins, Colorado. This project was started by a community in Denver who were concerned about how prairie dog populations were being treated and managed, so often with poison or lethal control, and they were trying to find out a way of doing things differently. So it was a, a working group that was set up at Colorado State University with local government agencies as well. Um, and slowly we got the momentum to actually kind of cross disciplines and have reproductive control experts working with uh, wildlife biologists um, and responding to what the community wanted to try and look at a different way of, of managing urban populations of prairie dog. It's a whole new area for me and it's, uh, um, it's been astonishing so far how everyone has universally been excited about the prospect um, from people who traditionally are not very keen fans of prairie dog populations to people who are huge advocates for them. Um, there seems to be a general understanding that we are, have to come up with a, an actual realistic solution to the issues as opposed to eradication. A couple of years ago, a company called Senestech came up with a oral rodent contraceptive that they call Contrapest. The product has been registered by the Environmental Protection Agency and is currently being used in several metropolitan areas around the United States to manage commensal rodents. We have probably over a couple of centuries of data of where we've killed rats. We've been killing them and killing them and we still have them. So that's not working. And the reason it isn't is because a rat is the most prolific breeder you will meet in the mammalian world. When you kill, you're not going to get them all. Two rodents mating over their lifetime have the ability to produce 15,000 individuals. So the numbers are on their side. They can breed their way out of just about any trouble. So controlling their fertility, that's the sustainable answer that we need to provide to our pest management community who are using traditional lethal compounds. People probably aren't aware that wildlife fertility control is underway now and more so with some species than others. The one going back furthest that would be close to urban areas would be white-tailed deer. 
Staten Island is unique in that the researchers decided to focus on the bucks instead of the does and have been conducting vasectomies on a high proportion of the buck population on Staten Island. It's the largest urban deer fertility control project ever conducted in the United States or anywhere else. So when we were contacted by parks, uh, New York City parks, the main complaints they were receiving about uh, the overpopulation of deer were deer vehicle collisions, destruction of forest habitats on park and private lands, and the high prevalence of ticks um, and the associated risks of Lyme disease. As of April 2020, the city had vasectomized 93% of the antlered males on Staten Island, and the fawn rate had decreased by 84%, showing a clear relationship between the number of sterilized bucks and the decline of fawn births. The decrease in fawning rates contributed to an overall reduction in Staten Island's deer population. In 2016, when the project began, researchers counted 2,053 deer on Staten Island. And in 2020, they counted 1,555, a 24% reduction in Staten Island's deer population. We are ultimately seeing fewer fawns uh, being recruited into the adult population. And uh, signs like that tell us that we're on the right course. This is the Black Mountain Herd Management Area in northwestern Arizona, where the Bureau of Land Management is mandated to manage a population of about 2,000 wild burrows that live in this herd management area, as well as the historic mining town of Oatman, Arizona. The pilot project we're doing here is to test the feasibility of being able to dart burrows with PZP in the field in these open ranges. The reason why we're doing this project is because we have these wild burrows in this HMA and they don't have any natural predators. The biggest challenge that I've faced being out in the field is the lack of education or knowledge that the public has on wildlife fertility control. Most of them have never even heard of fertility control being an option for controlling populations. Public education would, would be paramount mainly to manage expectations of people that believe that you can give the pill literally to any animal and everything will be fine. I think the important point is that a lot of communities don't really have any choice because their deer are living in places where they can't be hunted. The humane management tools are the way to go. I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. We, reproductive physiologists, who develop these methods, uh, we talk to each other and so we understand among ourselves what we're doing. But as we reach outside our immediate communities, that communication hasn't been as effective. And that's what we need to work on. These aren't insurmountable problems. It just takes some ingenuity and cooperation. And so I think that's what we're looking for, listening to each other and finding ways to cooperate. It takes collaboration of our entire effort. Those experts within a species those physiologists who understand reproduction. It takes our statisticians, but most importantly, it takes the public to understand and to be educated that this is not only an efficacious thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. This film is brought to you by the Botsteber Institute for Wildlife Fertility Control. The Botsteber Institute for Wildlife Fertility Control is a partnership between the Dietrich W. Bodsteber Foundation and the Humane Society of the United States. The Institute aims to advance the use of effective, sustainable fertility control methods to mitigate human wildlife conflicts and promote coexistence worldwide. Thank you to the following people and organizations for their cooperation in making this film possible. For more information, please visit the website www.wildlifefertilitycontrol.org.